Hey everyone, Max at the microphone again and today I'm gonna talk about how we found a way to spawn CSGO developers and monitor their actions behind the scenes. Using this method we discovered some pretty exciting information, so let's get right into it. I think that many of you have heard some news such as 3 or 4 or even 5 people as it was a couple years ago were spotted in a quote unquote developers version of CSGO. Usually this type of news seems to appear just before a new update hits and for the tracking everyone either used the SteamDB website or any other automated bots. In both cases the data is obtained via Steam API. Once every few seconds the script sends a request to the Steam servers and gets an answer which contains information about the number of people that are using the beta branch of CSGO for developers or just app ID 710 right now. This tracking works exactly the same way as the official online counter from Steam. However, the only information which we could use to speculate on is the actual number of developers being online in a certain moment in time. Nevertheless, how would you react to the fact that while the general public sees only plain numbers, we found a way that allows us to not only see which developer is online, but also on what maps, in what game modes and with whom they are playing. And this is just the beginning, because in addition to telling you how exactly it works, I'll also share all of the information we were able to dig up thanks to this espionage. To debunk the question about ethical use of this method, it's worth pointing out that prior to us this exact method was already known by a group of level designers whose maps were officially added to CSGO. They directly reported this vulnerability to the developers and judging by their action, or I should say the lack of it, the developers completely don't care that they're being watched. And to give you some additional context, let's just watch a small segment of Robin Walker's talk at Steam Dev Days in 2014. It's like a conference for the game developers held by Valve. You have to pay attention to our communication now. It's a positive loop. The more our customers pay attention to our communication, the more we can use it, the more we can do things with it, and that will make it matter even more, and so now they'll want to pay more attention again. The community starts to play the game, right? The game of figuring out which one of these bits is meaningful, which, which one of these things will matter, which one of them matters today, which one of them matter, will matter uh, a, year, a year from now, and so on. Speculation of this kind of stuff is a fun thing to do if you're a fan of the game. And if you're right, you essentially, you know, if you're the person who sees the connection that, you know, in this latest update to something that was teased, you know, two months ago or something in some other update, you get to win the internet, right? You're the person who saw the connection. There are videos on YouTube with hundreds of thousands of views today that, that cover the two years of hints that led up to our eventual release of the man versus machine update. And those two years of hints weren't expensive. They're all just little bits of work we did here and there, touching on things, or like a single texture here and a single localization string there and so on. Again, this is all about getting your customers to care about all the elements of your marketing. You want them to peruse your marketing, your communication, and so on with a fine tooth comb and pay attention to everything. This sort of stuff will snowball. It won't matter at first to customers because you first have to show them that it will matter. So your first sets, they'll, it'll be noise, and then as they suddenly start to realize this stuff will matter later, then they'll start to pay more and more attention to it. But not all of our communication is going to be that deliberate, obviously. Sometimes we, uh, we communicate in ways we don't even intend to, uh, especially in any kind of living product where you're constantly shipping. It takes a lot of effort to make sure you don't accidentally ship stuff. You know, we'll always accidentally ship localization strings or textures or models or a sound we didn't mean to mean about and so on. It turns out that that doesn't actually it's, it's okay. It's not dangerous. In fact, it turns out to be really, really helpful. It's going to cause the community to have a bunch of discussions. It's going to cause the community to have a lot of fun. They're going to pull apart what you, everything you ship. And the moment they first discover something in one of your, you know, somewhere in your files that you didn't intend to release that then matters in a later update, they've realized they need to do that with everything. So they're going to pull apart everything you ever ship. So the community has fun with that, and of course what we get out of it is we get a bunch of information about what the community thinks of something we haven't yet finished yet, we haven't shipped. Robin Walker, for those who may not be familiar, is one of the company's veteran developers. He's been at Valve for more than 24 years, and that's even before the very first Half-Life game was released. 
In terms of importance and influence within the team, he's like on a Gabe's level, since he is directly involved in day-to-day -day development. Whereas Mr. Newell simply approves or freezes the project by a snap of a finger. According to some unofficial reports, Robin Walker was the team lead for Half-Life Alex, and he was the one who sat next to Gabe during the interviews after the game's announcement. As far as I know, at the moment Robin is only involved in Source 2 based projects. And since the end of this June, he's entered the developer branch of CSGO 19 times. And it was on extremely unusual maps, such as Dev Preview Flat, Test Map Test Vonity, and Test Map Test Map 2v2 Entities. Do I need to tell you that the very fact of this person's appearance in the CSGO development field already looks a little bit suspicious? Especially considering that before the official announcement in 2019, Half-Life Alex was leaking via code strings for the four whole years. Right now we are seeing the very same sort of playing with the community that Valve has practiced for decades. So let's once again try to unravel the truth. Steam has a feature called Rich Presence. Roughly speaking, it is a system that integrated in any games you are playing right now. Basically, it just collects all of the useful information about your current game session. And in the most cases, this information contains just the game title. But some games like CSGO have an enhanced rich present system, and it collects a bunch of additional information, such as the game mode you're playing right now, what map you're playing on, who you're playing with, what's your round score, and much, much more. The most obvious use case for all of this information is just Steam's friend list. Just hover your mouse over some friend and it'll show you the most important information. And if you wanna know even more, just right click and select View Game Info. But wait, how would you look at all this info if you don't have any developers as friends? It's pretty simple a vulnerability in Steam that Valve doesn't care about. You could be offline, you could have a private profile, but using just your Steam ID we can send a rich presence request and pull the data packet with all of the useful information about your game session. Here's an example how it looks in a raw format. To organize the process, my friend and just a cool fella called Aqua wrote a boat that automates the whole thing. And in order to track only the necessary people, he took the profiles of all of the developers who appears to be in a private Steam group for Valve employees. However, it wasn't enough, because other non-familiar accounts continued to enter the closed CSGO branch for developers. Therefore, Aqua decided to take a desperate measure and parsed literally every user on Steam. And this was not an easy task, since the output was 27 files with 50 million IDs each. These text files weight more than 500 megabytes each, and in most cases the script just crashed. But in the end it was worth the effort, because we were able to find a whole bunch of dummy developers accounts and a few, if I can say so, contractors. Aside from Robin, I'll try not to name the other developers, but trust me, many of them have never been involved in CSGO development before, at least in the public field. So something weird is definitely going on behind the scenes. Especially since there's been more and more news lately that Valve is luring some developers from other studios. And to be more precise, there are some level designers like Lydia Zanotti who definitely works on CSGO, animators who used to work on a Halo series, heads of esports shows and project managers, and of course some programmers. In order to systematize all the collected information, Alex, the creator of the table which I used to calculate approximate release dates of cases and rotation of maps, came to Aquas 8. He made a separate spreadsheet which documents everything we need, which developer entered which maps and how many times. So right now, let's run through the names of the maps on which we spotted the developers. The most relevant and important are the maps with the postfix S2. I think it's pretty clear to everyone that we are talking about the maps on the or for the Source 2 engine. At the moment we spotted 6 of these maps. AR Shoots, CS Italy, DE Inferno, DE Lake, DE Overpass and DE Short Dust. I'm kinda agree that the selection is quite unusual, but if you think twice, it's kinda makes sense. 
Basically, you can play all of the existing game modes of Counter-Strike on those six maps. Obviously, without taking the Danger Zone into account. There are only two versions of the game in the developer's branch. It's 1.36.8.3 and 1.36.8.4. The difference is only one last digit. And the weirder thing is that absolutely all of the strange maps, including maps with the Source 2 postfix, were played specifically on a version 8.4. Based on that, we've made a speculative conclusion that 8.4 is the version of CSGO on Source 2, and 8.3 is the version on original Source. But what's interesting is that in addition to the weird maps, on 8.4 the developers also played on quite normal maps like Nuke, Dust 2, Office, Mirage or Train. The other weird maps we've noticed are 3 Test 001, Test Coin, Test Map Box, Tile Set Shadows, Batching Test, Test Map 2v2 Entities, Surface Layer Test, Test Weapon Spawn, Preview Flat, Test Vonity and Alpha Aggregate Test. If you have any suggestions about their purpose, please make sure to share them in the comments below. Especially if you work in a game dev and often encounter this kind of terminology. Interestingly enough, in addition to the CSGO with app ID 710, we can also observe the actions of the developers in a regular version of CSGO. For example, we can see how they're playing on everyday basis in a different game mode, such as deathmatch or matchmaking, and even see their current score. However, it is also kinda possible to extract useful information from this. For example, once one of the developers entered a version of CSGO that was higher than the public one. So based on that, we guessed that an update was coming out that day, and it was literally released a couple of hours later. Also, a few weeks ago, we saw that the developers have played on two community maps from the workshop. It was Tuscan, which was recently released, and Prime, a map for Wingman mod. This of course does not guarantee that they'll be added to the game, but for some reason it seems to me that we will definitely see at least Tuscan. You can find links to Aquas and Alex's Twitter accounts in the description. And also be sure to check my previous video where I'll show you the first gameplay of CSGO on Source 2 based in Sandbox. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button, leave a like and write a few comments. Until next time, see ya!